Good morning, everybody. Uh, my talk is about the retinal attachment associated with the uh, violet nitis. A very difficult uh, surgery to handle, but if you know the uh, the uh, nuances, probably it will be easier for you to take up these cases with more confidence. I have no financial disclosures. We'll first deal with acute retinal necrosis. As you know, it is. It's usually seen in immunocompetent young adults. It starts as a small uh, patch, one or more discrete foci in the periphery of retinal necrosis with occlusive uh, vasculopathy. And then it progresses posteriorly as well as circumferentially with a prominent vitreous and anti-chamber uh, reaction. And uh, the triad of post-segment changes involves vitritis, occlusive arteriolitis, and necrotizing retinitis uh, leading on to a, a devastating disease in the retina. You would all know that uh, RD is seen in around 75 to 85% of the patients, so you know it's how dangerous this disease can be. And it occurs almost after three weeks. So within three weeks, that's the golden period that we have to treat the patient. And what happens to the vitreous? It contracts because of the severe inflammatory changes and large retinal breaks develop between the involved and uninvolved uh, retina. And usually you will see the fellow eye getting involved if it is uh, not treated uh, medically. And usually it's seen within one to six weeks. You can have vitreous hemorrhage, but it's quite uncommon because the breaks are not seen in the uh, breaks are seen in the necrotic avascular retina. But if it occurs, there are no, uh, it's usually due to a new vessel disease, which can be treated with uh, photocoagulation. The main management, uh, management of air involves control of infection, inflammation, restoration of the media clarity, and prevention of retinal detachment and management of its complications. So medical manage, uh, management usually involves a confirmation of diagnosis with the AC tap or vitreous biopsy and intravenous uh, acyclovir is the, the standard treatment along with systemic steroids. You don't give systemic steroids alone and other therapies are also indicated. Laser is a little difficult in these situations because as I said there's a lot of vitreous reaction and uh, media opacity precludes laser but if, it, if you're able to do at least you do a three rows behind the active retinitis and at least 2000 microns from the fovea and 500 microns from the disc and you see usually done in the first three weeks of the disease. However, difficulties as I said, you face a phase, hazy media, difficult to treat, there are large posterior breaks and the retina actually progressively uh, involves even the laser areas and does really laser help. So there are studies which say yes uh, and uh, when we studied we found there's really no difference between the laser dye and non-laser dyes. Retinal detachment if it has to occur, it does occur. Retinal detachment, the features are uh, quite typical. You have large atrophic breaks, usually at the junction of the normal and inflamed retina. There's significant traction and epiretinal uh, scarring, there's PVR, vitreous base fibrosis and active retinitis is, goes along with this. So uh, surgeries for ARN usually, it's very rare to do a skill buckle because if you, if you have the ideal case where there are small breaks, a single coordinate and minimal retractors which allows you to treat the, buckle, uh, treat the patient with buckle, that's great. But usually you never end up doing that. You'll have to do vitrectomy because there's a lot of vitreous opacities, there's PVR which is already present, persisting inflammation, large posterior breaks, and the goals basically of vitrectomy are to remove the vitreous opacities so, and also clear the vitreous traction, the PVR. So it could be diagnostic, optical, or therapeutic, and all three in one in a single surgery. Management usually, uh, the most important thing is often and all we try to avoid the lens, but in this case you have to remove the lens because as I said, vitreous based fibrosis is very common and you need to do a very good vitreous based shaving and you have to support with an encyclic brand. So as I was saying, you can see there's already a PVD in these cases, but a little difficult to identify and the vitreous is quite opacified. So that's the most important thing. And generally what happens is if a lot of areas of involved, the retina which is involved and is scarred down is actually nothing like a fishnet. It uses tissue and it will actually contract and cause a recurrent retinal detachment. And uh, it's better to cut these areas so that it prevents traction on the posterior retina, which is what we need in these cases ultimately. So you see this is the sieve like retina that you have which has got no life of its own. So it's best to do a retinotomy and just release it from the posterior retina. And usually you will need a long acting tamponade and uh, sometimes yes, you will uh, try to go for a high viscos, uh, viscosity silicone oil. 
the surgical challenges in AR and cases are basically PVD. One is because of the vitreous opacities, it's difficult to really know the uh, difference between the vitreous, uh, positive vitreous as the, and the retina. So PVD induction, if it is there, I mean PVD, PVD is already, already there, it's easy. But if it is not there, you have to be a little careful while doing vitrectomy. There are multiple posterior breaks, the retina is thin. There is peripheral PVR, posterior pucker, is exaggerated post-inflammatory response. And always remember, there is active retinitis going along. So you try to induce a PVD over active retinitis, it's very difficult. Surgical outcome is basically uh, depending on the amount of PVR and vitreous reaction which is often at present. There is a lot of post-inflammatory sequelae. You can see macular pucker and optic atrophy and macular ectropia. So in, the gist is you have anterior PVR, which causes attractional RD in the periphery and hypotony and a posterior PVR which causes again a traction RD and a macular pucker which compromises the visual prognosis. Next we come to CME retinitis. As you know this is in, in exact contrast to a, a, ARN. We have an immunocompromised patient, hardly vitreous reaction, hemorrhagic retinitis and sometimes you have a frosted branch pattern and a very poor response to acyclovir therapy. So generally the, uh, the RD develops because there are holes in the glyotic scar, there is a synenetic vitreous and then you have vitreous traction just uh, and a break at the edge of the atrophic scar and usually you will not have a PVD and then you get a retinal detachment. The time course of retinal detachment could be any time, but, uh, any time after it heals. So there is no really uh, time gap just like in ARN. And it's difficult to identify the breaks basically because once uh, the uh, areas of retina which are involved heal up, there are, it's a lack of contrast. It's very difficult to uh, see a break preoperatively. And there's hardly any vitritis, no PVR. The RD may be localized or uh, total. And sometimes you have an exudative RD. So it's a little difficult. You have uh, ongoing inflammation which has been treated and you have a residual RD, which you don't know whether it's exudative or attractional. Medical management, you have systemic gansaclovir and if patient is an HIV patient, on heart therapy. The most important comes, uh, uh, role of a VR surgeon comes when you have to treat the RD. Demarcation low, uh, laser, unlike in ARN, where there was some role, here usually has a doubtful role. Skrill buckle, again, very rare cases, when the idle case is there, vitrectomy in most cases. Similarly, retinectomy as in ARN is necessary to remove the atrophic retina, which is useless. And long-acting taponide is necessary. So, as I... As I told you, PVD is really difficult, so uh, since it's a clear media, again you have a difficulty inducing PVD, but once you get the PVD, it's easy to manage. But you don't try to induce a PVD beyond the normal retina, because the scarred retina, there are dense additions. As you can see in the lower, uh, in the lower video, the, the vitreous is not being pulled across onto the atrophic retina. Up to that, you have to shave. So shave the vitreous as much as possible over the atrophic retina. Don't try to induce a PVD. Identifying the break is important. And uh, one clue is that you have Schlieren's. If you look at the uh, area where you can get, you can start seeing Schlieren, as you see in the upper half of the video, that is your uh, primary break. And once you get the breaks, then obviously you start uh, uh, doing laser and atrophic retina. And also, as I said, again emphasize retinectomy to remove the atrophic retina, which is not necessary. But most often, this atrophic retina is stuck to the uh, choroid, so you don't have to really do retinectomy. Insaclaj, again, as I said, is optional. And uh, long-term tamponade if the patient is not on heart therapy. If the patient is on heart therapy, usually we can uh, get by with a uh, short-term uh, tamponade. And silicon oil can be removed later on along with cataract surgery if needed. Anatomical vision prognosis, uh, it's a good thing that we have at least 70% of retina we can reattach in these cases and they have, uh, we have variations. This jabs at all uh, was before the heart therapy, so we have 20% ambulatory uh, vision. But once the heart era started, we have almost up to 70% of the patients are getting good vision, ambulatory vision. So the factors predictive of a positive visual outcomes, early intervention, absence of macular retinitis and healthy preoperative optic nerve. Thanks.